And so, but so in simple terms, what is the can something conjecture? <laughs> <laughs> I need to know that too. I did read the piece, Nathan, but uh, we're not very good um, at that side of things. Go on. Maybe I didn't explain it as well as I thought I did, but oh no, you did. Basically, but... it's just this guy Lothar Kollatz said that if you take any positive number. And if it's even, divide it by two. And if it's odd, times it by three and add one. Eventually, after repeating this process, it will become down to the one. Go down to the one, eventually. He said for every number, this will happen. But as of now, nobody has been able to prove that every number will go down to one because infinity is a pretty big number. But a lot of people have gotten close. Wow. Most recently, Terence Tao. That was, do you know what, Nathan? That was the most brilliant description because when it comes to numbers, I have to say I'm a dunce, really, really rubbish. So uh, please do do continue. Uh, that, that was quite amazing. So Flavia said, what introduced you to the Collatz conjecture? How did you come across it? Good question, Flavia. That's actually, yeah. Um... Not very long of a story, but an interesting one. I'm pretty sure I was just watching random math videos on YouTube and I came across like one that was like the most simple math problem that nobody can solve. And I was like, hmm, maybe I can. So I decided to look more into it and wrote my own code trying to brute force the conjecture. But uh, obviously unfruitful. I've gotten almost to a trillion numbers now. Getting close. It's like eight, 800 billion now. It's been running for almost two years. And yeah, that one YouTube video made me very interested in it. I've just, I'm in awe, really. I'm sure a lot of people are as well. That So you've written code and you're such a humble person as well. <laughs> Gosh, <laughs> goodness me. Um, that, that I think people probably agree with me. Um, so Flavia said, do you hope to solve it someday? Do you think it could be solved, Nathan? Obviously, I would hope to be able to solve it. Um, be a pretty relatively big breakthrough in the math field if somebody were to solve it. Um, I doubt that I will be able to do anything significant with the conjecture, but just doing my own research on it is interesting. Proving what other people have already proven is interesting. And it's a great way to get into the more theoretical side of mathematics if anybody wants to learn that spectrum of things. Um, anybody who's read Nathan's stories, I agree with you, Wimwin. Anybody who's read Nathan's stories will know that what a uniquely gifted writer. Nathan's put me off writing, basically. I used to write. And he's, Nathan, <laughs> I'm genuinely serious here. Nathan is much better writer than me. Um, but then you're a mathematician as well. There's a word for you. You are a, a polymath. Have you, have you heard of that word, Nathan? I have not heard of that word before. And I have yet well, to be described <laughs> as such. Well, I've just described it to you, my friend. You are a polymath. I mean, you're good at you are very, very skilled at many areas. So Claire's asked a question here. Yes, <laughs> Claire and I think along the same lines here. Um, how did you foster the interest for the topic math and the skill for English? We know you're an amazing author, but now maths, it's an interesting mix of subjects, just as I was saying. Um, <laughs> if I think about it logically, um, probably the most likely reason why I like math and English is because for a long time, since like first grade to sixth grade, it was pretty much just focusing on math and I did hardly any writing until oh. like seventh grade, I think. I'm speaking in US terms. I'm not exactly how that would translate into the UK system, still getting used to that. But um, like for the last last two years, I was in a Turkish education system and there you do no writing at all. Like, I think I only wrote one article about a book report to kill a mockingbird. I think it was one time and that was it. And so the whole entire time 
because I was also learning Turkish and I didn't really know the language very well. And math was like universal. Anybody can understand it. So I focused on math for a long time. And then when I came to CHS, it was a complete like flipped upside down. Like, whoa, I'm writing stuff now. And like, this is really fun. So <laughs> yeah, I think writing for me is more of a hobby than I would say a chore. And math is something that I just really like researching. So beautifully put. Jamie's had his hand up. Jamie Curry's had his hand up very patiently. Go on, Jamie. What did you want to say, love? I wanted to say about, about that YouTube video who, um, and the simplest math question. Was it, it people acting to not know it or did they really not know it? Well, um, nobody really knows how to solve it. It's just out of all the unsolvable math questions, it's one of the simplest because it's just based around like simple multiplying, dividing and adding. So in concept, it's very simple, but to prove that it works for every number, it's a very difficult. And I could link the video if anybody would like to watch it. Um, Nathan, please, please do. I think uh, I'm. I think everybody's really, really impressed. Oh, um, Conrad's linked to the video, so we'll certainly have a look at that. Um, do you know one of the best things about being a teacher is that you learn so much from your students. I would never have heard of anything like that because. Um, as I say, I'm not at all good at math. So thank you so, so much, um, Nathan. Does anybody have anything to ask of, of our lovely Nathan before we move on to our next little talk? I'll tell you what, the most massive round of applause. And if you haven't had a chance to read Nathan's story, the library, please do. I, I sort of I, I just fell apart when I read Nathan's story in the library. It was absolutely incredible. Thank you, Nathan, so much. So who's next in our list then, guys? Perhaps Conrad can tell me. <laughs> so who do we have next? To, oh, it's Kai, is it? Oh, brilliant, Kai. That would be fantastic. So I believe that you're a presenter. Let's just check that, Kai. Yep, Kai's a presenter. So if you'd like to present your screen and just talk through your piece, please, Kai. Yeah, just give me two seconds. Of course. Can you see that? We can. All right. So I wrote my paper on functional brain mapping and brain mapping was first invented in the 16th century and basically it uses three-dimensional imaging technology to create a personalised map of the human brain and then that map is then used during surgery to preserve eloquent areas of the brain which can co control critical functions such as vision, movement and language. So in surgeries like um, getting rid of tumours so you don't damage errors that are needed. And I got the idea to write the paper from a TED talk I watched by Jack Gallant. And he was talking about brain mapping and how it's the brain is basically a piece of technology itself. And it was really interesting. So I did some further research and came across functional brain mapping, which was a bit different to what he was talking about and how it can be used in surgery. So yeah, thank you. That sounds fantastic. I've just found that video actually. So I'm just going to put the, I'm just going to pop it in the chat, guys. So everybody, oops, sorry. I'd have heard my computer then right. So I'm just going to pop that in there. So everybody can have a look at that. Um, questions for Kai, please, guys. I have to say, 
Oh yeah, sorry, Flavia said, do you have any ideas on the next, on what the next steps of brain mapping could be? Oh, uh, I think there's chances of it being used even in diagnosing certain psychological things, if we can get deeper into the brain and stuff. But that's like a lot further down the line. Um, oh, Alia. Do you think the brain will keep on evolving or is it going to like stay stuck at one place for a while? That's an interesting question. It is. Um, I think it is a constantly evolving organ and it's also known as like the master organ, so it controls everything. So also as, you know, as we develop, it develops because as we create new things, we're going to have to, the brain's going to develop because we, yeah, develop with it. Okay, thank you. That's such an interesting point. I just interject, I remember watching a documentary with Stephen Fry and a guy, um, this man had had a stroke, but they found that other, so he lost his power of speech, but other parts of his brain took over and he was able to speak a little bit. Jude, did you want to jump in there? You're looking like you, uh, you, you have something to say there, darling. Oh, no, no, no. I was just saying that it was quite interesting reading um, Kai's article because I'm I'm quite interested in brain mapping and I've watched a similar video about how brain mapping can actually help um, paraplegic people who can't speak. And so using electrodes and um, electrical impulses, they can write out the letters and words um, on a computer screen with the help of artificial intelligence. So I found that very interesting and intriguing. Just wanted to put that out there. Um. Nathan's asked to you, Kai, what made you want to write about brain mapping apart from the TED talk? Uh, I'm a big Grey's Anatomy fan and <laughs> they've said uh, they, I saw I was watching the episode and it was talked about on there and I was watching Grey's Anatomy the other day actually and now I'm going to go and look into 3D organ printing as well <laughs> so yeah. Oh fantastic. Hey, isn't that interesting? 3D organ printing. Goodness me. Perhaps a new brain for Mrs. H at the end of the day that can do math. That would be really cool. So excited. So um, Flavia says, are you looking into neurology for your own future? Or was this more a hobby? Can you imagine doing neurology as a hobby? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm looking into um, neurosurgery to be even more specific. Just like Jude Kai, that's what our yeah. do. You perhaps you guys should stay in touch. And Winwin has said studies show that AI will one day replace doctors as brain mapping is crucial. This is it's a very intelligent question, this Winwin. Will we ever be able to convert that to a code and to embed that onto such intelligence? What do you think about that, Kai? I think it's possible that, you know, we wouldn't need humans to run these things. But a lot of people are saying, AI, as AI is evolving, if we evolve with it, it won't get rid of us. So <laughs> you just need a base. So yeah, basically code could do it, but there could be ways that humans do it that code can't replace. Yeah, I, I, I hope, hope that is the future. And Agnes said, did you notice you liked a particular subject that was related to this subject before you discovered the video? Were you interested before the video, I guess? Uh, yeah, I've always been interested in like neurosurgery specifically. So I'm pretty sure it just came up like in my recommended on YouTube from watching like <laughs> other neurosurgery videos. That's brilliant. I'm, I'm, I'm super impressed, Kai. Um, that's really lovely. Um, I just does anybody else? Sorry, I wanted to ask Jude a question. Does anybody else have any other questions about the whole idea of, um, of what to do? So, yeah, <laughs> let's keep in touch, says Win Win. I'm, I'm slightly off topic, but Jude, I was just going to ask you, perhaps you could stay in touch with Kai to because obviously you're there you're studying you're studying to be a neurologist I was just wondering how how's it going and how far you are you on your journey Jude oh it's um going very well um I have my final exam on Thursday physics which we do talk about physics as a med student but <laughs> um after that we're going to start semester two in 10 days and I'm really excited because in semester two we will actually 
um, delve into if it's physics related, it will be medical physics. So we'll talk about diagnostics and radiology and um, some parts of neurology as well. So that is very interesting. I hope semester two will be more fun than semester one, even though semester one was really nice. And um, yeah. Fantastic. Um, <laughs> oh, Ali says I don't want to touch brains. I'd rather design things. Well, yes, brain brain surgery isn't actually for everybody, is it? So there we go. Um, does anybody else have a question for Kai? Fascinating, isn't it? The idea of, of brain mapping. I think I've got perhaps a really this is probably a really stupid question actually um but considering you know I'm, I'm somebody who doesn't think about the science science at all and has never been very good at science can you map somebody's intelligence could you tell somebody's iq from brain mapping it probably is you're probably going oh this is h give up go away but what is what what do, what do you think kai would that ever be a possibility i think it probably would be uh, at the moment, we're only at the surface of the brain, really, like being able to tell the different areas apart. But once we develop it further and are able to go literally into the brain, it's definitely a possibility. That would be amazing, wouldn't it? Do you think there's scope for improving people's intelligence through brain mapping? <laughs> maybe maybe and it's, it's all yes it is all like well who's to say isn't it Do you know what, i think anything is possible with science and technology combined right that's really interesting and i'm just going to bring in something from my subject because for a level language um and we've got one or two people i've got so i'm just looking for who, at who does here does a level english language and i know flavia and xenia do actually um, what one thing we've learned, which is fascinating to me, is that you have to learn, you have to acquire language as a child by a certain age, because oh, Jude, Jude's nodding at this. I'm wondering if you're familiar with this, Kai, because bits of the brain it's very efficient, and if you don't use little parts of the brain, I'm being very unscientific here, they they die off, and so so if you're not getting fed with the language, basically you'll never learn to speak. Is that something you've ever heard of? Yeah, yeah, I've heard of that. Oh, fantastic. Can you can you give me your take on that? I'm really uh, willing you here because I'm so interested. <laughs> I agree because um, I think as, as well as being an organ, it's also it's basically a muscle. So if you don't use it, it gets weaker. Uh, really, really interesting. Jude, would you come in on that for us? Actually, this is really funny, but I was tested on this in psychology for linguistics and um, the, relating to linguistics. Um, yes. Like Kai mentioned, um, it is important to really train the brain. So, for example, um, when a child is about 18 to 20 months old, new words add on, and then they can form basic sentences each time as they grow older. And the precursor is actually bubbling. So, you know, when kids do, blah, blah, that <laughs> is a precursor actually for talking. And it's actually really interesting to um, think about it because both deaf children and um, children who have the vocal ability have bubbling, the precursor, but it ceases immediately with deaf children. That's why they're mute. Um, and this kind of ties in with cognition as well as behavioral. So for example, you would notice that a person that reads a lot at a younger age would be more intelligent, more articulate with wording than a person that was in a more deprived, less intelligent setting. It's, it's oh, there's so much to learn, isn't it? Alia, I see you've got your hand up. Yeah, so I have two very short things to say. So the first one was on the um, on the like language thing. I've I uh, I think it has been scientifically proven. I think that if it's harder to learn a language when you're older, for example, imagine you're like 28, not that old, but not that young, you know? No offense to anybody who's 28. I know there's nobody here who's 28, but that's fine. Um, it's gonna be harder to learn like a language than when you're gonna be like nine or 10. For example, I'm 10 and I'm trying to learn Spanish, then it's gonna be easier. But if I try at like 20, it's gonna be way harder. 
and you know, it's really interesting. It's so true because Flavia has also said um, that is it easy, has also asked, sorry, not Flavia, Emily has also asked, is it easier to exercise the brain by learning multiple languages as a child than as an adult once the brain is fu fully formed? I think we probably know the answer to that, don't we? What would you say, Jude? Actually, um, despite common myth, um, learning a language older um, as an adult is much more efficient than learning it younger. Reason being is because the brain isn't fully developed. So discussing it between like cognition and whatnot, you're just inserting the brain with information without letting it really process the information and, and storing it into your like long-term memory. And so when you're older and more intelligent, you have the capability and the capacity to store that information. So despite common belief of thinking that um, younger children will um, learn languages better, it's actually the opposite. Really interesting. Um, Zenia said, you go to school not to achieve, but to exercise the brain. Well, it's a really good point, isn't it? Can you imagine if your teacher just told you things and you didn't ever try, you'd be the teacher could say, well, I've taught them, and you'd be like, but I haven't learned it. So it's really true that. Claire's saying, what's your take on emotional intelligence? She's saying IQ and EQ. Um, I've heard police, sorry, I've heard people believe it doesn't exist. So do you think we could measure EQ? <clears throat> and do you have any theories on how? I haven't got any theories on how, but I think it definitely exists for starters. And uh, it's definitely going to be able to be measured in some form, whether that be through brain mapping or some different form altogether. Yeah, and, and, and perhaps it will one day. I will come to Jamie in a second. But Winwin said a very, very good point again, Winwin. Can you identify small cancerous diseases and prevent them from growing bigger? In using brain mapping? So with functional brain mapping, it's basically it's done after you found the tumour to see where the tumour is, is in correspondence to areas of the brain that need to be kept without being touched or, or else there'll be major damage. But I think maybe not necessarily brain mapping, but there will be a development in the technology of finding tumours to be able to find the ones that cause the most damage, even if they are so small that we can't currently see them when we need to see them. Mm. So it's really it's fascinating stuff, isn't it? So much. Uh, sorry, Jamie, you had your hand up then, didn't you? Though? Um, I am still thinking of what I was about to say. <laughs> That's absolutely but, fine. He was. I've heard the saying that you can't can't teach an an old an old guy your new tricks. <laughs> that is lovely. What do you think, Kai? Can you teach older people, ancient people like me? Can you teach them new tricks with hard work and persistence? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Always. Oh, I think you can. <laughs> um, That's absolutely lovely. It's like it's like the same thing, but you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Um, it just takes more time, and <laughs> you, because it's also because with age comes maturity, and also a set way that you know how to do things. So if you try and teach someone a different way to do things, they're going to struggle with it more because they want to do it their way, and they want to. They think they know the right way. Oh, so it's mindset. That's really interesting, isn't it? Um, just just absolutely brilliant stuff, Kai. Thank you so, so much. <laughs> but yeah, teach old people tricks with patience and persistence. If anybody would like to teach me something, I'd be very patient. So wonderful stuff, Kai. Thank you. Really, really enjoyed that. Um, who's who's next on our list then, gang? Comrade, comrade, do you want to share your screen, my love? And our beautiful Claire's going to read it for you. Oh, you love quantum physics, do you, Win Win? Goodness me. I think I'm going to leave you to quantum physics. So, Claire, you said you'd kindly read this. 
<laughs> yep. Okay, so Conrad says hi. So my two articles are in physics and music, both of which are my major interests. The first articles were on quantum physics, offering an insight into some fundamental basics on the quantum theory. Quantum theory has become so important to our lives these days with competition in quantum technology and the 2023 Nobel Prize on quantum dot. Second one was on music. As a musician, I am hugely interested to how music was performed in the past, as we can see in development of music composition within and instruments and how time affected it. Yes, so it is basically it. It is about learning more about the past and how it relates to our music playing in modern day. There are some wider reading re resources in the journal, so do have a look if you're interested. Feel free to ask any questions, although I can't, although can't guarantee I would like I would know all the answer. Yeah. <laughs> That's really, really nice. Um, oh, and so Conrad has said he will tutor women, which is really, really lovely. I, I really like that. I'm going to do you know what I'm going to kick off by asking. Um, you can put obviously put your answers in the chat. Con well, does anybody know what quantum physics is? I know quantum means the measure of something, doesn't it? But what on earth? What on earth is quantum physics? Perhaps, comrade, you can pop it in the chat for us. What do we mean by quantum physics? <laughs> I certainly, certainly do not. So we'll just wait for comrade to type something up here. <laughs> the, oh, the physics of life, says Win Win. I'm sorry, Win Win. I'm, as a dunce, I'm no further forward with that. Yes. Oh, do you know what, Claire? You're so right. It, here's another polymath. Often physics and maths and music go hand in hand, strangely. So, Comrade says quantum comes from the word quanta, which relates to a small scale. Oh, and quantum physics is trying to understand the world in that scale. So it's a no, I never would have known that. That is that is absolutely fascinating, isn't it? And um, can you give what we're trying to say here? No, does anybody else have any questions for Comrade? Right. Oh, it tells us. Oh, gosh. How would Schrodinger's principle be allowed, uh, applied to another aspect of physics? I understand the principle, but not its applications. So Comrade says it tells us how wave functions evolve with, or without WRT or with respect to time or without respect to time. So it's one of the most important laws. Oh, goodness me. Is anybody else? <laughs> Not, I think a lot of you are much brighter than me in science. And you, does anybody want to challenge that? Because I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to really struggle with this one. <laughs> so Flavie says, how far do you think we can dissect the universe um, using quantum physics? Oh, Ali has answered the question here. It's basically a very micro world on Earth. Microorganisms in the ground. Thinking logically, it would almost be impossible to get in the quantum realm, but say that to the producer man. Goodness me. <laughs> really, I'm really fascinated earlier. String theory seems to be working. <laughs> oh, this is Claire. That's a really good question. Then we'll come back to you, Alia. Can physics relate to music in any way? Yes. What a brilliant question, Claire. What would you say to that one, comrade? Really, I think that's a brilliant question, Claire. <laughs> So we'll just wait for a comrade to type his answer here. Ah, oh, so music are waves and physics can describe waves. Quantum theory describes the world particles as waves. 
wave function. Do you know, I think I need to go back to your journal entry and have another read of it, um, comrade. I really, really do. It's this is fascinating. There's oh, so much, isn't there? When I think that you guys do physics at school, perhaps I should jump into some lessons. That would give the teacher a shock, wouldn't it? I'd love, love to just understand it in, in very layman's terms. Um, does anybody else have a question? Um, oh, wave function is a function describing properties of the respectable particle matter. Um, oh, microorganisms in the sound waves. Gosh, it's getting very, very um, esoteric, very quick. <laughs> oh, here we go. Women. Will humans ever understand infrasound? In yes, infrasound. Oh, what do you think to that one, comrade? No, part. Oh, right. Particles aren't living things. I see. In so infrasounds are below twenty hertz. Thanks, women. That's really interesting. Do, do you have any insights to offer, oh, physics guru lady, since you're doing your physics exam soon? Um, honestly, um, we will not actually be able to distinguish or listen to infrasonic waves because obviously it's below human hearing. Um, and I do not think that with future progress with physics and quantum physics, I don't think that we will still be able to listen to that because it's just by nature. Um, that we can only listen to 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz, which is 20,000 hertz. Yeah, it's, and it, it is, that's fascinating. So Zenia said, cymatics combines music and physics. Do you know about it, comrade, or do you have any interest in combining your musical talents and physics knowledge? Oh, yes, yes, that's true, actually. So the traditional answer would be a sound engineer. But that's yes, perhaps not where you're thinking of going. And um, can I ask you, Cameron, what do you what do you plan to do? I presume it's something with physics in the future. Thanks. To read theoretical physics at uni, well, isn't that brilliant? I think we need a massive round of applause for Comrade there, don't we, guys? That's uh, really, really cool. <laughs> oh, there's one little question that's just sneaked in. Sorry, Alia. We'll just, uh, before we let you off the hook here, Comrade, do you think we'll be able to hear ultrasonic waves in the near future? If not, do you think we might find another type of sound waves? That's a really good question, isn't it? Ultrasonic waves. Oh, <laughs> Winwin says, I'm not sure whether there are ultrasonic waves, ultrasound waves. Let's see what. Um... Oh, you meant that right. So waves above 20 kilohertz. <laughs> hey, don't apologise, Ali. I had absolutely no idea what was going on at that point. That was uh, pretty impressive. Do you think we'll be able to hear those, Conrad? Let's see what Cameron has got to say before we move on to our final talker. Oh, through evolution, that's an interesting thought. <laughs> you could transpose the frequency. This, yeah, that is a philosophical question to ponder on, Conrad. I'm really, that's a really good point. It's interesting how all the different fields really meld, isn't it? How they just mesh together. Thank you so, so much, Conrad. Let's have another round of applause for somebody who can think in ways I could only dream of. Absolutely so impressive. I'm so impressed with it, that. Who's our last speaker this afternoon then, guys? Yeah, my dad did a PhD, actually. 
Because that was a, a doctor in the end. But a doctor of chemistry, not physics. <clears throat> so who have we got? Is there, is there one more person to speak? It, oh, Jude, oh, sorry. God, Mrs H, I thought you like that. Jude, what, is it, what have you got to talk to us about my love? Oh, you've got your article as well, of course, yeah. Yeah, um, I don't really have a script, so I'm just going to be talking. I hope I don't bore anyone. Um, but uh, greetings, everyone. I'm honoured to have been invited to speak today. I've really missed my interactions with each and every one of you. And for some of you who don't know me, I used to be the former head girl in CHS. Uh, my cherished memories of CHS accompanying me with the start of this new chapter of my academic path. So my article proposes a definition of for happiness and whether it, can, uh, whether it can be measured. The arguments were derived from a compilation of various research studies and books. I objectively scrutinized whether the definition of happiness could be standardized. If it's measured, is it reliable, valid, by adopting um, quantitative and qualitative methods? Ultimately, I concluded that happiness can't be measured as there are numerous differences between past research papers and their validities. Now, what gave me the idea to write about this topic? Well, neuroscience and psychology are fascinating fields which intrigued me. The address question grasped my attention as there were so many unanswered questions. It piqued my curiosity and quite frankly, I had a number of ideas for this topic, therefore I chose it. I would say that I thoroughly appreciated the research process um, whilst doing this article because really taking my time to reflect and hone in on the essence of the question. How past researchers had various ideologies um, compared to the ever evolving modern day concepts. The deeper I dug, the more I was captivated by the topic. Even if you consider it as a psychological topic, it has deep philosophical roots embedded within it, um, which made the experience of formulating this article more meaningful. The challenges um, of the process. The most challenging part was inserting relevant information without overloading the judges' brains. Um, if you didn't know, this article was, um, I was a prize winner for this psychology essay from Oxford University. And so it was a painstakingly difficult process to find research that supported my reasoning and perspective, as uh, every piece of evidence seemed as though it needed to be a part of my essay. Uh, the purpose of the John Locke essay competition, if anyone wants to join, uh, is to convey rational, pertinent, and concise points to prove that your viewpoint is correct while still acknowledging and respecting opposing arguments. And if I do, if I'm inspired to do any new research on, well, um, I genuinely hope that with the guidance and the support of my biology and psychology professors, I'm endeavoring to publish a new research paper called The Link Between Epigenetics and Trauma. So don't you just find it thought provoking why grandchildren might experience war PTSD without actually going through the traumatic experience or being in the war? Um, could it be genetics? Could it be cognition, behavior? Well, uh, this is to be discovered soon. I don't have the answers yet, but hopefully I will. Uh, additionally, I am also actively participating in a study created by my professors, which is um, Medical Students' Expectations of the Future, a multi-site longitudinal study. So this study will focus on the ideologies of first-year medical students and how they might alter over the course of the six-year program. So I'm super ecstatic to view this paper in six years' time. It's a long wait, uh, but honestly, it's worthwhile. I hope that you were able to draw inspiration insights from my brief um, article overview. I wish you all the best and please do not hesitate to reach out to me at any time for inquiries or support. Um, my dear Flavia will put my social handles, my Gmail and my Instagram if anyone wants to contact me. Thank you. Definitely Jude, I really missed you. <clears throat> Does anybody have any questions for our lovely, lovely former head girl? Bronwyn. So I just wanted to say hi, Jude. Um, it's been a very long time since we've um, met each other again. So my question is, um, if humans were um, intelligent enough to um, develop a way to measure happiness, will they ever um, advance into measuring um, other emotions, um, simple emotions like anger, sadness um, and things? 
Well, that's a really good question, Raymond. But um, from my personal point of view, I do not think that we will be able to standardize measurements for happiness or any other emotion. Think about it. If I asked you what was anger, each one of you would have a different perspective on it. What makes you angry might not make me angry. And so the different ideologies and psychological perspectives makes it even harder to make measurements that would be standardized and universal around the globe. But I do hope that maybe with future research or maybe um, with artificial intelligence, um, who knows, and technology, there could be some involvement with that. Thank you. Um, Emily has said, are there certain parts of the brain? That's a really good question, Emily. <clears throat> Excuse me. That report that, sorry, that become more active when would people report being happy. Can happiness be measured as biological activity? Mm, a cracking question. I really like that. Well, thank you for your question, Emily. Um, well, yes, there are some certain areas that report emotions, for example, Maybe some of you might know that um, the amygdala is the part where it um, reflects emotion. And so, yes, you can have sort of chemical imbalances, for example, serotonin, which is a hormone that elevates when you're happy. You could measure that, but at the same time, you need to think of the individuals. Not everyone has a standard composition of all the hormones. So say, for example, I might have, let's say, 25% of serotonin as a neurotransmitter. Someone else might have 30. And depending on the person's maybe um, susceptibility to disease and thinking about risk factors and protective factors, it's slightly difficult to measure it biologically. But that is um, one of the techniques that was used by past researchers to try to measure happiness, which didn't really um, unravel that much into the discovery of what happiness is and whether or not it can be measured. I hope that answers your question. Just brilliant. Nathan says, could one become desensitized to happiness? What a very, oh, we're getting very philosophical here. Um, thank you for your question, Nathan. Um, I believe, and this is my personal belief, that yes, you can become desensitized to happiness. Um, think about it. Let's say if we had a child that went through multiple traumatic experiences um, and was in a deprived environment where everything was pessimistic to them, yes, they might not see happiness that much. And actually, there is a theory and a cognitive theory that is called desensitization by, I think it was Wafa. I, I don't remember the article itself. But um, you can desensitize someone um, in ways you you wouldn't imagine, for example, um, if you're talking about happiness specifically, um, you could do that. But um, in general, desensitization is a normal thing and is actually a type of therapy for certain individuals. Like, um, I don't know if you've heard um, what a kleptomaniac is, but it's a person that has the tendency to steal things. And so if you desensitize them, um, it would most likely decrease the urge and obsessive and compulsive Miss um, of stealing. So to answer your question, yes, I do think happiness could be desensitized and hopefully with um, further development in the medical field and the psychological field, um, we will be able to understand it better. Um, thank you so much, Jude. I've just flicked onto the, the second screen here and see that Bo has his hand up. Bo, what did you want to ask, love? Um, so it's been really interesting what you've been saying and I'm, I'm very, very interested but my question is kind of basically have kind of to do with it but also nothing. How are you doing? <laughs> How happy are you Jude? So what a gorgeous question. Thank you so much for um, I've been doing well thank you for asking uh, I'm just trying to get through my finals and have my final exam for physics and just be done with semester one um, it has been a journey um, transitioning to medical school because it's quite different from high school um, if you guys want to know the college experience it's quite different um, when you go into college no one really um, checks in on you or not checks in on you but you are more responsible for yourself so 
um, if professors give you assignments, if they give you lab reports, for example, you have to depend on yourself. They're not going to keep saying that you have this assignment, this assignment is due, blah, blah, blah. It's more of your responsibility and um, how you want to progress in university. So some people are more lenient with uni, um, some are more studious and like to study and then take breaks. For example, um, with me at least, I do try to take breaks um, during the weekend. And so besides common belief of us med students studying 24 seven, we do not study 24 seven. That would, that would literally cause burnout. Um, but yeah, um, if you prioritize your time and you have time management skills, then you should get through uni and specifically med school um, very well and smoothly. Um, and thank you for asking again. <laughs> That's lovely, but <laughs> Ali is asking a question as well. Go on, Ali. Yeah, just two small questions. But what would the first one is what would happen technically? Like this might be a very weird question, but what would happen technically if everybody in the world didn't have that emotion anymore? Like what would happen if humans evol evolved to not have that emotion anymore? That is not actually a very weird question. That's a quite interesting question, Alia. Um, if I'm understanding correctly, you are asking whether or not, like, if we evolved to not have emotions, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, if I were to think about it in a hypothetical situation, I think would everyone would be robots at this point. Everyone would be a copy and paste um, because emotion is what makes us really different. And our psychological perspectives and uh, perception itself is a phenomenon which differs from different individuals. So if I were to think about not having emotions, I would think that everyone would be basically a mechanical human being mm. having nothing or being a robot. Absolutely. Jude, I'm going to read, um, we've got five minutes left, guys, Flavia's question, because it's quite technical. So it says, quantifying qualitative data is the fundamental tool for scientific discovery and scientific growth. Is there any emotive disadvantage to this? Centuries from now, living in a fully standardised society, would it erase some aspect of humanity? Whoa, that's extremely, <laughs> this, again, rather Whoa. esoteric. Yeah. That is a very philosophical um, question, but I'll try my best to answer that. Um, I don't really believe that certain uh, quantitative measures are the um, answer to everything, because especially dealing with emotions, and like I've discussed in my paper, Happiness is something that's qualitative. Each one has their own ideology about happiness. If you go through philosophy, Western philosophy, Greek philosophy, uh, Chinese philosophy, each one has their own um, idea about it. Um, I think if you were to quantify everything and standardize everything, it does remove an aspect of humanity because you're just looking at it in the sense that the person is not a social being and it's just numbers and analysis and statistics. So, to answer your question, I do think that it would erase a part of humanity if you just kept quantitative measures. And that's why it's really important with um, diagnosis and patients that if you do do psychometric tests, for example, to test out, um, let's say, for example, depression or whatnot, um, that you look at them as a psycho, a biopsychosocial being, meaning they have biological functions, they have a psychological brain, and social circumstances can influence uh, both those factors. It's amazing. See, we've got so little time left. I, mean, I bet everybody could stay here till about, about midnight. But um, Nathan has, says, has said, is happiness possible without sadness? Well, that's a good one, isn't it? That is a very good one. Um, is happiness possible without sadness? The truth of the matter is, I do think that happiness is possible without sadness in the sense, well, actually, I have two arguments. My first argument would be that no, because what would be happiness if you didn't have a counteractive emotion? For example, how would you say this is happiness and maybe it's not sadness? You need something to reflect those two ideas so you know which is which. Maybe you could say that a person, you might see a person is happy to you, but it, they could be um, sad. So if you were to remove the sadness emotion, you wouldn't actually know what happiness truly means. Um, and was there a second part to that question or? Um, oh, no. Nathan, 
Yeah, I'm just sort of I'm having to do a little bit of cherry cherry picking here. And um, Claire says, has there been an evolution of emotions? Have new emotions been discovered? Or have perhaps that's we just put a, labels to them? Oh, that is a very good, that's a good one, Mrs. Howard. Um, basically, <laughs> oh. with emotions, um, we do have basic emotions. And with time, um, theorists and researchers have decided that there are more complex emotions. For example, Standard emotions would be like, let's say, anger, happiness, irritation, surprise. But um, if you think about it, it isn't just one standard emotion. For example, me being on here right now, I don't just feel happiness. I also feel excitement. I also feel a sense of anticipation. So it's a concoction of emotions, really, um, that you deal with. And it isn't just one category of emotions. So yes, we do, we have, um, with time, researchers did develop or discover rather um, complex or new emotions. It's, it's a fascinating topic, isn't it? I think we've got time, one minute left for Flavia's question. Is there another more profound or incomprehensible element to emotions than just hormones on the sign-ups? <laughs> Yeah, I definitely think so, um, because you can't take everything into a biological standpoint. So if I were to mention cognition, everyone, not everyone, but basically basic cognition and processing is different. For example, individuals with um, anxiety or depression, um, their processing is actually quite different from a regular person. So, so for example, if they were to come into a consultation and they have this sense of anxiety, um, they pick out, they focus, or their attentional span really will focus on one sentence, which is your diagnosis. They won't think about the treatment plan, they won't think about the course of medication, they won't think about adhering to the medication and the medical therapy. So I would say that um, um, you can't solely rely on obviously biological, you need to take every aspect. And this is where also sociology ties in because certain individuals have different social circumstances. For example, maybe a low income worker would experience um, more social stress. That social stress can be converted to maladaptive coping mechanisms, which are like smoking and drinking. So it's very important to know that every um, aspect of psychology needs to be taken into consideration and it isn't just one. I hope that answers your question, Flavia. Just amazing. Thank you so much, Jean. I'm really pleased to have a, a way of messaging you. <laughs> um, you know, I'd love to stay in touch, guys. And uh, Jude's kindly um, given that, given Flavie her, her details. Do you know what? What's an absolute pleasure to host this. Mrs Trafford asked me if I would because she's not very well, bless her. Um, and what, what a privilege, to be honest. Um, yeah, and, and when I echo what women said. Thank you for spending so much for spending time with us. So thank you ever, thank so, you much. ever so much. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I've just, I've just come back to say I've got my I've got my blanket around me. I've just come back to say thank you. It was so clever, so interesting. And um, we've got it all recorded, so we will put it up on our YouTube channel. You've you've all done brilliantly and nice to hear for, from some new students who I, I didn't know before as well. Amazing. Thank you, Mrs. Howard. Hostel, thank, thank you, Kai. Kai. Nathan, Nathan, Comrade, Comrade and Jude. Super stuff. Okay, thanks okay. so much, thank guys. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you so much. Really, really. Thank you. Bye, fol